Now I have to start this video out with perhaps one of the greatest lines in the history of film. Now you see that evil will always triumph because good is dumb. And if you've unfortunately never seen this before or don't even know where it comes from, it's actually from Spaceballs, a Star Wars parody made by Mel Brooks back in the mid 80s. And it's a film I'd highly recommend checking out sometime for a good laugh. But the reason why I play that or bring it up is because of how dumb the good guys can sometimes be in films or shows. Though to be honest, oftentimes it's the bad guys who seem to be the truly dumb ones and let the good guys win by just being, well, by just being dumb. Despite the fact that what tends to make for a truly good and riveting story is when both sides are pretty much equally competent, though not necessarily equal in terms of advantages, you almost always want your villains to be a bit stronger or in a better position from the start to make the victory for the heroes all the sweeter in the end. And what makes it even better, no matter what side ultimately wins, is when, instead of a series of stupid errors taken advantage of by one side or the other, it feels more like a tense, well-played chess match, where both sides act wisely and keep making the right plays, but in the end one manages to pull off a brilliant move that barely outsmarts or outwits the other, and they get the win. A good example of what I'm talking about of a series of stupid mistakes rather than one side simply outplaying the other happened in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, which means spoilers incoming if you haven't seen it all yet. And it happened in the fifth episode when, first of all, Bail Organa sends a very detailed and unnecessarily detailed message to Obi-Wan Kenobi, despite fearing that Obi-Wan has been captured being the actual reason why he sends it in the first place, which means Obi-Wan will never get the message if Bail's fears are correct, and actually the only ones likely to get their hands on the message is bad guys. This is then followed up by Obi-Wan failing to delete this very specific message, one that can lead someone to Luke, before then giving this communicator to Haja, who ends up just randomly dropping said communicator and not picking it up, in a place that Riva, our villain, will find it which will send her to Tatooine to do something we know she can't succeed at, that being kill Luke. This is an example of, well, it's an example of bad or lazy writing, but it's also an example of good guys just being dumb and or careless and leading the bad guys to the gates of victory, though they don't seem to be able to walk through it, Regardless, this isn't even close to the only type of dumb thing we tend to see out of our heroes in films or shows, though the other isn't so much stupid mistakes as it is just being extremely inconsistent with morals and we the audience are just supposed to overlook and or not think all too much about it. And I like to think of this as the good guy paradox in stories, and there um, just so happens to be a very good example of this in the, you guessed it, in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. That being when, in the final or sixth episode of the series, Obi-Wan Kenobi has a chance to kill Darth Vader once and for all to rid the galaxy of this great evil, but he lets him live for reasons. However, in part four of the very same series, just a couple episodes earlier, Obi-Wan Kenobi breaks into Fortress Inquisitorius to rescue Leia, and when he finally reaches her, he finds there are two whole stormtroopers guarding her, but despite being a Jedi and likely having a means by which to simply incapacitate them, he decides to hack them to pieces with a lightsaber because, well, if we're being real and honest about it, it's because it'll look cooler for the series and no one really cares about stormtroopers, right? Though maybe I shouldn't say he hacked them to pieces since for some reason the lightsaber had a very hard time cutting through stormtrooper armor. These two must have got the upgraded stuff that actually does something unlike every other set we've ever seen in the movies and stories before. In other words, as far as the writers seem to be concerned, Obi-Wan killing them without thought was fine, but dismembering them would have been way too far. Even though in all reality, especially considering he's a Jedi of all things, Taking their lives should have been something he did only if he absolutely had to, if there was simply no other way around it. I mean, heck, we've even seen Jedi literally debate the moral dilemma of killing Sith Lords who have committed unspeakable atrocities. They've argued if it's right or not to kill someone who has started a war that led to the death of millions upon millions of people, and who wanted to rule the entire galaxy. But a random stormtrooper who may have never done anything truly bad in their lives, short of working for an evil regime like the Empire, they deserve no such considerations, none whatsoever. Somehow a Jedi will agonize over killing a Sith Lord, and in this case, or the case of this series, will actually let one live and go on to keep murdering people, but they don't give a second thought about killing a Stormtrooper. That just makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And don't get me wrong here, Obi-Wan's priority is absolutely to save Leia, to save the life of an innocent child, and you could certainly argue killing Stormtroopers, if need be, 
is warranted in this situation. They are, after all, not only watching over a kidnapped child, but they were about to watch her be tortured by Riva until an alarm went off, and the I'm just doing my duty argument falls apart pretty quickly when you're willing to sit back and watch a child be tortured. I mean, in the real world, we generally have no remorse or understanding for those who commit crimes against children, and I can't imagine that it'd be all too different in the Star Wars galaxy, that there'd be a high degree of tolerance for that sort of thing there. And if the Jedi were ever going to treat someone rather harshly, I'd have to imagine it'd be someone who harmed a child or even killed multiple children, unless those crimes are um, committed by Darth Vader, I guess. A literal, again, child murderer who is not only a part of the aforementioned evil regime that apparently automatically condemns any stormtrooper associated with it to death without a second thought, but he is someone who actually claimed to be that it's his empire. I have brought peace. Freedom, justice, and security to my new empire. And this is to say nothing of all the other non-children who have suffered greatly because of Darth Vader. For some reason, this guy, the cold-blooded killer who even goes so far as to tell Obi-Wan that anything that was once good about him is dead and gone, that guy gets to live. That guy Obi-Wan has mercy on, while the stormtroopers have to die because, again, it's simply cooler that way, and the writers don't think or care about consistency. About trying to show how a real Jedi would act in those situations, because it's simply not flashy enough. We also then get to see Obi-Wan basically show mercy and or forgiveness and understanding to Reva, thinking her to be, I guess, a good person now because she um, didn't end up killing the child she was moments away from killing to satisfy some sort of personal vendetta. Which I guess also means we the audience are just supposed to conveniently forget that she threatened to kill Owen and his family earlier in the series, that she cut off a woman's hand for backtalking her, and, as mentioned before, was seconds away from torturing Leia, to say nothing of everything else she's probably done off-screen. So yes, let's commend Obi-Wan Kenobi for being someone who can let literal killers walk away, and all likelihood to kill again, all the while being someone who also just kills stormtroopers without a second thought, that is somehow supposed to be a consistent character and a story that enhances him and or the overall story. Even though in Revenge of the Sith he didn't show mercy to Anakin, he actually did the opposite. In that film he not only leaves Vader for dead on the shores of a lava river that's burnt him to a crisp, but he lets him continue to suffer instead of putting him out of his misery, or in theory getting him help I suppose. And yes, he does leave him for dead or thinks he is doing that, this very show, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, makes that very clear when Kenobi learns from Reva that Anakin is still alive and is surprised to learn that. That's not someone who expected Anakin to survive being, again, left for dead on Mustafar. And so am I really supposed to think all that highly of Obi-Wan Kenobi after this series because this time he intentionally lets Darth Vader live? That despite saying it, he doesn't do what he must and end the existence of a child-murdering monster who will absolutely go on to kill again. All the while, he slaughters stormtroopers who may have joined the Empire for any number of reasons and who almost certainly have not done anything even remotely close to the level of evil Vader or Reva has done. I mean, as I said before, certainly stormtroopers who, again, may have joined the Empire for any number of reasons and may have sob stories of their own, certainly they deserve at least as much understanding, if not maybe a little more so, than Sith Lords and Inquisitors. And no, I'm not saying unfortunate circumstances or wrongs done upon you justify your own bad actions or behavior. The old saying, two wrongs don't make a right, holds true. And I'm certainly not saying we should excuse the stormtroopers entirely because they maybe had a bad series of events or no other options and that's why they became stormtroopers. Or maybe they were recruited against their will. Who knows what their story is. Either way, just because evil is visited upon you doesn't mean you get to visit it upon others. And another saying that relates to all of this that also holds true is that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Though I'll now have to amend that to include them also being dumb which Obi-Wan very much was when he let Vader live. It also means any blood Vader spills after this is also in large part on Kenobi's hands. Though maybe the oddest part about all of this is that the whole message behind Reva's story is that she does deserve understanding and forgiveness because of what happened to her, that Obi-Wan does believe her evil actions were justified because he simply lets her go. The writers are actually justifying her actions, her response of committing evil acts because they were done upon her first, 
via not only, again, letting or having Obi-Wan let her go, but by also, I guess, expecting us, the audience, to be sympathetic towards her. And I know some might want to immediately compare this to everything with Vader at the end of Return of the Jedi, that Luke lets him live, and Anakin gets a sort of redemption, and we're meant to feel sympathetic towards him. But the differences there are, well, first of all, Luke stopped himself from striking down Vader in anger, plus he'd felt that there was good still left in his father. While, on the other hand, the whole point of that scene in the Kenobi series between Vader and Obi-Wan is for him to realize his friend, his brother, is completely dead and gone, that Anakin was killed by Darth Vader. This is the liberating realization Obi-Wan comes to, that not only was it not his fault, but that his friend is truly dead, as he even says, which means there should be nothing holding him back from, again, killing the monster that is more machine now than man. Also, if Luke strikes down Vader, again, out of anger, he still has to deal with Palpatine somehow. Obi-Wan is, again, not only calm or found a type of inner peace, but he doesn't have to worry about anything else after the fact. Furthermore, Vader ends up dying regardless, while Reva ends up being allowed to simply go free. Also, Vader or Anakin made a choice to kill Palpatine in the end, he earns at least a tiny sliver of forgiveness for that, while Reva only made the choice not to kill an innocent child. But anyway here, and though, yes, I do think Kenobi letting Vader live in this series is one of the worst, dumbest things I've ever seen, and Reva's story is also quite sketchy, the whole Stormtrooper thing, Obi-Wan killing them with reckless abandon, not to mention how often something similar happens in other stories where the fodder is simply slaughtered by the heroes, Honestly, that doesn't bother me that much. I just find it very interesting to bring it up because it's so often completely overlooked by people. Plus, I would have been very impressed with the series if it had shown Kenobi, at the very least, trying not to kill Stormtroopers, unless he absolutely had to. In fact, one of the reasons why Stormtroopers likely wear helmets in the first place is so that we, again the audience, are less likely to see them as anything but evil drones that we're not supposed to think of the person underneath the helmet. This is why I was initially impressed that Disney was going to go underneath that helmet with a character like Finn in the sequel trilogy, but let's not get into all that. But anyway, going along with all this, I do wonder if the reason why Lucas decided to have a droid army be the enemy of the Jedi during the prequels was to avoid this very sort of issue or problem to stop anyone from asking how a Jedi could justify killing so many actual people, even in the name of or to safeguard the Republic. Basically, by having droids, there was no one alive under helmets to ever maybe be a little bit curious about. Well, that's all I've got for this time. Now it's your turn to take to the comments below and tell me what you think about all this. Does it bother you when the good guys kill indiscriminately in stories, or is it something you don't think about or even just care about? Whatever the case may be, leave your comments below. Let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.